This video is part one of a series of videos laying the foundation to understand diabetes and its effect on the eye. This is a graph of blood glucose after a meal. The blue line shows normal behavior. The orange line shows how different blood glucose behaves in someone with diabetes. In this video we will discuss how the body normally handles glucose and in the next video what happens in diabetes. Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist in Santa Cruz, California. This is the first of a set of videos leading up to explaining diabetes and its effect on the eye. To understand diabetes, we will start with how the body handles glucose and how insulin works. In part two, we will look at the basics of diabetes. Remember, this information is for your general understanding of diabetes and in no way replaces consultation with your doctor. Since this discussion is eventually about diabetes, let's begin with what is diabetes? The traditional answer is, it means your body does not have good control over the level of glucose, a kind of sugar in your bloodstream. A more complete answer is that diabetes is more about insulin than about glucose. Decreased production of insulin or decreased effect of insulin, called insulin resistance, results in a number of metabolic problems, elevated blood sugar among them. In the next video, we will cover the basics of diabetes. Since this story traditionally starts with glucose, let us begin there. Glucose is one of several simple sugars. Here are two six-carbon sugars, glucose and fructose. Individual sugar molecules can be combined as pairs or into long strings. For example, a glucose attached to a fructose makes sucrose or table sugar. Attaching many molecules of glucose in a long chain makes starch. In other words, the carbohydrates or starches that you eat are made up of sugar molecules either singly or in groups. Glucose, it turns out, is the most common and important one. The way the body handles glucose is a bit complicated, so we'll break this process down into steps. First, the carbohydrates you eat are broken down by the stomach and intestines into their individual glucose units. The glucose then passes through the liver, where 60 to 80 percent of it goes into storage, and the remainder ends up in the bloodstream. Glucose is stored in the liver by recombining it into long chains called glycogen, a lot like the starch you just digested. This serves as a reservoir for later release when glucose is needed. Once in the bloodstream, glucose is delivered to different organs, where it is the principal source of energy. The brain prefers to use glucose almost exclusively. The muscles can use glucose for energy and store some for later use. Fat cells take extra glucose and use it as part of triglyceride production. The intake of glucose is only the beginning of the story. The action of insulin is the next part. Without insulin, you have glucose with nowhere to go. When you have a meal, there is extra glucose available. The pancreas senses that and produces insulin, which is the key that opens the door allowing glucose to enter certain cells. In this illustration, the insulin interacts with a receptor on the surface of a liver cell. Triggering of the insulin receptor then activates a glucose transporter that brings glucose into the liver cell. And actually, insulin does a whole lot more. When insulin docks with the receptor on the surface of a cell, that activates a chain reaction inside the cell which produces multiple important results. Regarding glucose, as we just said, insulin activates the transport of glucose from the blood to the inside of the cell. Second, it activates enzymes that assemble glucose into glycogen for storage. However, insulin also acts as a signal for cell growth, protein synthesis, and fat synthesis. That makes insulin a key factor in multiple parts of your metabolism. Let us recap. We have seen that when you eat, starch is digested into glucose units. The pancreas senses the increased glucose and releases insulin. As glucose passes through the liver, insulin allows it to enter the liver cells where most is stored for later use. The remaining glucose enters the bloodstream stream to be transported to other organs where it's used mostly for energy. Between meals, glucose in the blood is used up and must be replenished. 
stored glucose must now be released. As blood sugar falls, the pancreas senses that and produces another hormone, glucagon, which reverses the storage orders. It signals the liver to start breaking down glycogen and turn it back into glucose. In this way, the body keeps the level of glucose in the blood within a relatively tightly controlled range. When something goes wrong with glucose regulation, resulting in high levels of glucose in the blood, that is what the term diabetes refers to. But diabetes is more about lack of insulin, or reduced insulin effect, which is covered in the next video, Diabetes Basics. Here is a preview. This slide shows how blood sugar behaves in a normal person after eating. We'll call the start of the graph as fasting, like in the morning before breakfast or between meals. The normal fasting value is around 90. After a meal, the blood sugar peaks at about an hour. As soon as the pancreas senses the increased glucose, it secretes insulin, extra glucose into storage, and, and by two hours, the blood level is back down near normal. Between meals, the stored glucose is mobilized as needed to maintain blood sugar. Now look at the person with diabetes, the orange line. The fasting blood sugar starts higher, say 125 or over. After a meal, blood sugar rises to a higher level and stays higher, still near its maximum, at two hours. It is from this clearly different behavior of blood sugar that the tests for diabetes are based. In the next video, we will continue with the basics of diabetes.